talk again about God's work in our lives and ministries and around the globe. You guys know I'm Blair Lynn, but for those who are listening, I'm Blair Lynn, and I'm here with my friends Aisha De Lopez, Sharon Dickens, and Sujin Park. And we're going to be talking about how we can wisely use social media as Christians. Sue Jin and I uh, are here in the, well, we live here in the United States, um, and social media in the United States is pretty all-consuming. Uh, it shapes our political campaigns, our trends, how we communicate with one another, what we buy, what we watch, and we've seen, I think in the last several years, that it really has had a huge impact on the American church. Recently, the Gospel Coalition released a book on social media called Social Sanity in an Insta World, edited by Sarah Zylstra. She's one of the contributors. And Melissa Kruger actually talks about our use of social media in this way, and I'm going to quote her. She says, unfortunately, there's no recipe for social media. Each person has different reasons for being online and different reactions to what she encounters. An online article that sends one person into a fit of rage might be hardly noticed by someone else. A beautiful living room may invoke feelings of jealousy in one woman's heart, while another woman might feel joy and inspiration at the same picture. As we engage on social media, we desperately need discernment. I like to define discernment as wisdom making a choice. Some women may choose not to use social media at all. Some women may take breaks. Some women may put limits on their phones to monitor their usage. We need a combination of knowledge, wisdom, and experience to grow in our ability to choose what's best for our own lives while not expecting everyone else to come to the same conclusions, end quote. And so um, as we start this discussion on social media, I kind of want to hear first from Sharon and Aisha, since you guys are outside of the United States looking in. And just a reminder for those listening, Sharon lives in Edinburgh, uh, Scotland, and Aisha lives in Guatemala City, uh, Guatemala. Um, What does social media look like in your part of the world? Uh, what's amazing is when you hear about the polarization and the, the, the usage, the time we spend on it, it cuts across so much alike. But I think it goes back to science because it's, you know, our brains are wired basically the same. And so they, people at social media engines know this and, and there's science behind why we're so addicted to it and how it shapes us. It might have some variables, but I do see, you know, teenagers obsessing about their looks the same way in every corner of the world. I see um, women uh, panicked over, you know, this media scandal or this false news, whatever, um, just the same. So it's, that's weird in that sense. We're so alike. I mean, I would, I would definitely agree. Um, I, th- I think that um, we use the same the same apps, the same platforms. Um, we've actually picked up, so it's one of those things that I think is globalizing in the sense that even some of the turns of phrase we would use um, are, are, are probably the same whatever context we're from. Um, so I do think that, yeah, we probably are exactly the same. Same fights are going on, like the same thoughts are going on in girls' heads. Like the same TikTok video sounds been going on in the same place fifteen times, like yeah, so yeah, similar, similar, similar. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, Sujin, do you have any thoughts on just social media in general here in the United States? And I mean, it's just like what you said. I think it's all consuming. I think, especially in the last couple of years, we've seen how much it drives people to different thoughts, beliefs, actions, and. I'm sure we all have a lot to say about how it's affecting the church as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I mean, we're aware of the dangers, even as we've talked about some of them, whether that's teens and, you know, their self-image. We know there's a rise in anxiety and depression and covetousness. Um, I kind of want to highlight like some of the positives. (laughs) Can we focus in on like, what what are the good things that you see when you engage in social media, specifically related to the church? Any good things happening? Yeah, I I can attest to that. Um, We know the dangers, like we all know the dangers. But I have to say that my faith took a turn for the, you know, for the better um, via Twitter out of all places. You know, people really... That's unusual. That's unusual. (laughs) I know. And I have to recognize the fact that it is unusual. Sadly, it's unusual. But it took the kindness of a stranger 
to actually start feeding me um, just encouragement. And that was Jairo Namnun. Uh, some of the TGC crowd might be familiar with his name. Uh, but he was kind to me over social media. He asked kind questions, really like genuine questions about where I was, my faith. And, and little by little, we became actual friends, like to the point where my family flew to the DR last year to be with their family. And so we've become you know, family. Um, and I know that's not like the ending to every story, but I have to, we have to remind each other that it's real people. We are engaging real people and we cannot control everything that bombards us, but we can control what we contribute to the platforms and, and, you know, never lose your hum humanity while using the the if you if you choose to be on social media, be a person, be a sister, be a witness, you know, in everything you do, because I I so much of what I do have and enjoy today as a Christian came about because of a stranger being kind to me over Twitter. <laughs> Praise God. Um, that is actually I mean, it's sad in one way because I'm. Um, you had to go so far to feel kindness. Um, but it's also amazing in another way because there was doors that were opened that never would have been before. And um, one of the things that, um, I'm not a big massive fan. I mean, we talked about this last night and I'm not even going to hide it. Like, I, I'm like, if someone wants to talk to me, come and see me, phone me up. I don't feel like we're having real conversation when it's on, on Facebook. Um, and but actually, there's so much good that's there as well. So, I, like Kaisha says, I have to think about the um, my my example, how my example in Christ, or like being a decent human being and a and a good um, example as a Christian. But actually, um, I've found social media really helpful for not only telling people about our ministry, but keeping in touch with um, the friends that we meet along the way. And so as part of 20 schemes, we bang into a lot of people and they're not, they're, they're not all going to become great friends, but some of them have. And actually some of the ways that you keep in touch with their lives, uh, see what's going on through Instagram, watch the, the, how their churches have evolved or um, even celebrate. And when one of them um, I've been praying for and have been seeking the funding to find a church for a long time and then watching their first service on a Sunday morning, that, that's great. It's a great way to engage with um, and keep those um, relationships alive in a different way. But it's not the only way that you would do relationship. Yeah, and I think um, despite the pitfalls of social media, one thing it does is it allows the global church to be more connected, right? It, and I think social media, it's global by nature. We all share the same apps, but it, especially within the church, like I can follow a missionary halfway around the world and see how they're doing in their ministry. And that's something that wouldn't be possible without like newsletters being mailed out months later in the past, right? And so I do think there's a lot of positives that come from the connection of the global church through social media as well. That's good. And, you know, I think I'm reminded that not everyone has a thriving local community. Um, so for some people, like being able to reach out to someone through social media, that's kind of the only encouragement that they may have. Um, you know, maybe there's a few people in their community or in their local church serving the Lord, Um that they might actually really be encouraged, right, to follow someone. So um, what are your thoughts on this idea of being followed or being an influencer? Like, should we be striving to be influencers as Christians? Yeah. Um, so you hear it more with young people today. I do hear, like, they want, like, that career choice, which is unfathomable to unfathomable. <laughs> to me, because it's it wasn't an option. Like I became one, I guess, uh, on accident. Like I had no idea. Well, we we I think a generation didn't have any idea of what was going to become with our social media platforms. Um, and you know, a lot of um, a lot of young guys just since they grew up watching that, they want it. But I, also, I always warn them to about that because you have to be really careful 
What is it that you want? As a Christian, you should want the glory of God and to serve Him. And if He chooses to use your platform and grow it because He wants to organically, that's His prerogative. But it not, it's not something that you should actually desire because it's really dangerous. Any sort of limelight on you, any sort of... Um, you know, um, uh, self-made influence. It's, it's, and it ends up being toxic and you should really be careful. Um, as someone that uses social media, I feel responsible and we should not, um, you know, evade the responsibility like, oh no, everyone has a responsibility. They should choose. No, I have a responsibility and I choose to use the social media that God has allowed me to grow, uh, to point to himself and to the local church. I don't want to be a substitute for real community, for real counseling, for real uh, church attendance. And so when you, what you were saying about Connection Global Church, whenever a person feels um, so desperate that they would come to me via inbox, it's heartbreaking for me. And I can't tell you that a week goes by without a woman opening her heart to me via DMs. And that's so sad. But what I do is, by the grace of God, you have a network of churches. You have a network of sisters all over Latin America for me. And I ask some questions and say, I am not capable of, you know, walking with you and I don't live near you. So if you're comfortable, would you allow me to connect you to a sister that's near you? And I've done that over the years. And it is so warm and fantastic to just learn about how they have found somebody in their hometown or in their country, even if they're far away. Um, so we should not want the platform. We should want advance the kingdom. And I think that's there's like a key difference between having a positive influence for the kingdom versus being an influencer. And I think it's really comes down to like your conscience, right? And what you desire in your heart. And I think, you know, we talked a little bit about this in our previous conversations on our own about how in a way we should all strive to be a positive influence. We should strive to influence the other women around us to love the Lord, to love their local churches. But I feel like the difference is when you want to be an influencer, there's so much internal pressure to curate certain type of content. There's so much pressure to um curate an image for yourself that goes beyond just pointing to the gospel. And so I think I do see a lot of Christian women who, when they start receiving a certain amount of following on Instagram, Twitter, whatever, it, I think it's really hard not to get into that, that pressure and temptation to want to turn yourself into somebody more than just pointing to Christ and the work that you do. And so I feel like it's really like a heart question. You have to ask yourself very honestly, what is it that you desire or what's masked behind um, your intent? Like what is the true intention behind what you're doing? And I think, um, I also think you need accountability. You need people in your life who are willing to ask the hard questions of, hey, you're starting to have this following. Like, is this more about your platform or is this more about God? And I, I think that's really important or else you're really just going to get in your head. I, I, I'm reminded of the proverb which says, the crucible for silver, the furnace for gold, and man is weighed by the praise he receives. And I, I agree, Sujen. I, I don't think that we were made to be able to receive this type of praise um, and even all the likes. I mean, you know, it's like we really do have to be careful. We really do have to guard our hearts um, because I think it, it can set us up for pride. I think it can set us up where we may even start off saying this is about the glory of God, but then we find ourselves shifting because, you know, sometimes other people respond to us. You know, you keep hearing like, oh, you're so wonderful. Oh, you're so godly. Oh, you're a virtuous woman. Oh, you know, and you have to keep your mind on straight. You say, okay, Lord, well, who do you say I am? You know, who do you say I am? Uh, and, and who am I in relation to you, oh God? Um, not the praise that I'm receiving. Um, all the glory must go back to, to God. Um, and also, do you have a community, a real, you know, like what you said, um, Sharon, about 
who do you meet with face to face? Who who's your pastor? <laughs> who's pastoring you? Who's you know be, who who sees your flaws up close? Um, I think that is pivotal if you want to function. And social media needs to be an overflow of your real life. You know, it it shouldn't be a production. It should be an extension, and uh, and um, a part of what you want to be made be made public, but not a facade, not a not a version of yourself that is not real. I don't show everything about my life in my public um, spaces, but what I I show is real. It's part of who I am, um, and I've vowed to take. You know, for example, my Instagram account, I've been uh, approached by people who want to pay for advertisement in my in stuff. And I've made the decision to know because I respect the people. You know, I my, my books are about suffering and basically adoption, adoption in Christ. And they come to me with serious things. I'm not going to show up just selling you something and just be dissonant in that space. So I remember that it's real people. Um, a friend of mine who's an Avila um, actually taught me to pray over my, the people who follow me and to pray for how I serve those people. I think that brings it to another level of humbleness and of realness that I do need. Um, But, you know, on the flip side of that is um, as we strive to remember that the people who follow us are real people, I think what we forget is often, I mean, I have a pri I only have a private Instagram page. I haven't gone public and maybe I'll change my mind one day. But as of today, I think one of the main reasons I kept it private was I think often the people on the other side forget you're human. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily go both ways. And one thing I've realize being in this ministry position that's more public, you know, doing speaking and writing is that there's ironically this almost like dehumanization that happens in ministry where people see you and they forget that you are human and need grace as well. And the more people in your life that see you that way versus the people who know you just for you, your, you know, all, with all your flaws, I think it's it's really hard to like like you said you have your head on straight and it, um and i what i that's kind of like my personal reason for not having the public page is um i think when you develop following online you have to always remember that that's kind of a risk you take right is that the people who follow you will not always see you as human and so there's more of that responsibility and there's more of that um separation and distance that you have to intentionally place so that you don't get so affected by the things that people are saying and expecting of you as well preach and, and i think I'll, sorry <laughs> i was just thinking some of the time we we do our thinking after the event And so the, the, the and it's, my mum would say, you can't like shut the gate after the horse is bolted. Um, the, the reality is we, uh, we get ourselves so far gone and it's hard to draw yourself back. And so when we were sitting thinking through how we, um, we did social media, media with our, our, our ministry, I mean, I like you, my, my stuff's private. I don't really, unless I know you, And or I've met you, and I know whose face it is. And you're you're not being one of my friends, but actually, um, it's I, f I feel a protection in the fact that when it comes to the the public persona of our ministry, it's the ministry that's there. So it's not down to so twenty schemes, women's ministry is not just down to me. We have a, a group of us, and I feel like that accountability that you were talking about the that that depth that we get from um somebody just like sometimes um challenging your pride or mocking you because you need it um, or even just bringing a, a a bit of truth and saying actually what they were saying to you wasn't real um th that that protection of the ministry was a decision that we made um and then it's much easier to promote something that's that's not a person um it's not it's not reliant on one person there's actually a team it's not about one th and it's it's very purposeful in the way that we've done everything and particularly at 20 schemes women and i love that word that you use purposeful and I, i think actually that's a good place to start for anyone who's thinking about social media is what is your purpose like why are you choosing to be on the particular platform because we all may have different goals in mind so for us we may be thinking about ministry someone else might be thinking about this as a job. What if they do make 
candles or, you know what I'm saying? And they want to sell those candles. Uh, it may be nothing wrong with taking those advertisements, right? So it's like, what is your, or you just m- may want to post pictures about your kids or dogs or yes. whales. I mean, I don't know, <laughs> you know, whatever. <laughs> um, you know, so, but yeah, knowing what is the purpose? Why are you there? Um, and then you can stay focused on your calling, you know, what the Lord has called you to. And I think that's really important to bring up too, in that not all Christian women have to be Christian influencers on social media. Like for me, I just want to post pictures of my dog, my meals that I'm eating, and see pictures of my friends, and which is why I've purposely decided not to be public. And I think that's okay. And I think just to release other Christian women from this pressure of having to have this persona or be the super influential person online, you don't have to do that. Not everyone is called no. to a space. I love that you made that, uh, you caveat in that um uh, I love that because it's very nuanced and it's personal as everything else in your walk with Christ. It's personal. And like I mentioned, I, you know, I never set out to be this. It just came about. And then I wrote a couple of books and just people gravitate toward whatever it is that you're, you're saying. And so it becomes this. And so I've learned how to manage it or I'm learning how to manage it as I go. But if you want, if you want this, just be purposeful and be objective. And and it's so important that, that to know that everything we do in life is worship. We have to remember that whether you are, um, you know, on a on a desk because you're a secretary or because you're you're a doctor or you're a teacher, it's just different kinds of ministry. But we're all serving God all the time. And but there is a tendency within us, because we're sinful, mm-hmm. to turn into someone who likes to be worshipped. Oh, yes. I um, mean, it's nice having people say nice things about you. Um, and it's hard not to, I mean, it's hard not to listen to that. Um, and it, it, that's where good accountability comes in. But it's also hard um, to listen to the things that are not so nice that are being said about you. Or, And so I, it's a personal, dis- I, I don't engage with any of it. So nice or not. Um, if they're on our, t- I, I, I don't want to know what they've said. When we post something on a blog and it's replied, one of the team answered it because it's not good for my soul. Like if it was uh, somebody's giving me praise, that would not be good for my soul. But also if it's somewhere where they're just out to attack or make a point or I mean, that's also something I don't need to dwell on. And that makes me think about back to Melissa's uh what I quoted at the very beginning when she was saying, like, it really is personal, you know, for one, you know, you may be able to be on social media all the time. For another, you may create some boundaries. And I guess, um, you know, my last question is, what would it look like if you do need to create more boundaries? If you do need to say, I need to take a break. Well, how do you think through that? Even whether that's, you know, caring for another sister who you may observe who's on social media quite often, how could you encourage her if she needs to take a break? I think um, it comes down to how you function in real life. If you're being, um, if you're stumbling in in the way you, you go about your day, if it's consuming more attention than it should, and it, you know, you linger way too much, which I think all of us at one point have, then you need to push back and and say, okay, this is not healthy, or this is dangerous, or or, this is not good for my soul. Um, And sometimes you have blind spots, and we all need help in that, I think. um, So we have a process when we do one-to-one and accountability, and one of the questions is always, is there anything that's been more important to you than God? And it's the first question, but um, we all say no. But if you start backwards at first, like question 17 and work your way forward, um, there's a whole series of questions that show you what's more important to you and God. And so when it comes to a 10 minute quiet time versus an hour and a half skimming through Instagram, then there's a misbalance there that needs to be addressed. And if you have someone that's constantly, not every moment, but is a regular part of your life and is intentional, like we were talking about and the last episode of Hospitality, someone who is intentionally speaking into your life, asking those questions. Is, is, is your use on social media proclaiming Christ or, or yourself? 
Um, who, like, how are you inter- engaging with people when you're talking to them on Facebook? Who is it that you are representing? Because if it's yourself and not Jesus, there's something wrong. But then also, are you spending far too much time? If I've spent an hour and a half scrolling through Instagram, looking at all the little videos, and I've only like looked at the Bible for 10 minutes, then I need to readdress my life. And so for me, I think those constant questions of having someone intentionally in your life where you give permission to ask the thing. So for some people, it's not an issue. But for people who know it is, giving them the permission to ask the hard questions is a really helpful way to go about it. And how do you encourage? Because I imagine it's not a one-to-one. It's not like, man, I've been scrolling for an hour. I haven't spent time in the Word. Let me go get in the Word. How do you, how do you encourage someone's love for Jesus um, so much that they want to spend time with him rather than spend time on social media. You know what I mean? Because I think like some people can um, create laws. They can create rules. I've been on social media 10 minutes. I need to be in the word. 10 minutes, you know what I mean? So if, if I do if I do 10 minutes of a quiet time, right, I then I get 10 like minutes YouTube. on Instagram, you know? Um, <clears throat> I mean, everybody knows their hearts. I mean, we pretend we don't, um, but we lie to ourselves all the time. And the truth is, for some of us, it's not an issue. And um, for me, I struggle because I am entertained by, it's not the video, it's the, um, the diversion of it. And so it's like a, I check out for however... 55 minutes it is, and that's not good for me because it's, uh, it's, it's just not a helpful way to deal with anything that's going on. And so I know that about myself, and I've tried all the things that are legalistic. I've put like a little um, thing on your phone where it says at 9 o'clock you've got to turn off on your, your social media, and you can just click a button and it comes back on again. <laughs> like There's no real heart change there. But my I pray with one of my girls every week, and the... the the, the, the prayer is exactly the same. I probably say this prayer like every time I sit down with women and girls. I pray that, that God will help me to love him more, uh, love myself less and love other people better. And I think until I readdress and realign my heart to his, head in the right direction, I'm always just going to be pressing yes to continue. I mean, it needs to be real heart. It needs to be a drive. And the only way that that's happening is if I go to God and ask him to change me. And so whatever it is, some of us it's social media, some of us it's like Netflix, some of us it's like, um, it could even be really good books. Whatever it is, like it's that the heart change can only be transformed by like a repentant heart before God. Yeah. And I think especially for women, um, like you're not going to know you need a heart change unless you know that this thing is causing you to sin, right? And so I think just simple, easy question is, is my usage of social media causing me to sin? And I think a lot of women, if they're honest with themselves, would say yes, particularly in the area of covetousness, right? Like I can't even imagine how many women are constantly being bombarded with the images, the fake images (laughs) of lives of other women and, and they're always asking, why can't I have that? Or what, you know, how do I accomplish that? And I think it affects people a lot more than they recognize, especially, you know, we always talk about how young teens are affected by it. But I think older women don't recognize how much it shapes their perception of themselves and their own lives and how it makes them less content. It makes them discontent with their own lives. And so I just think a simple question is, is this causing me to sin? And in what way? And if yes, like maybe that's it's time for a break. Mm-hmm. We know we have our favorite question to uh, close out each episode, which is shining a light on our differences. And so I wanted to ask you all, not that we're promoting overusage of social media, but what (laughs) is your favorite app on your phone right now? Sharon, you want to share first? Um, Mine would be, I I love Instagram and I do like pictures, um, but actually it's one of the few platforms that my brother will use. And so my brother's in South Africa and it's a long way away. And he's a typical guy. He just won't send you images. But he um, doesn't document his life all the time. But you get glimpses of like what restaurant he's going to, how the kids are doing um, throughout Instagram. So I love it for that. It's, it's like a family album of all the people that I like to see. So yeah, it's my fave. Yeah, I'd say it's between Twitter and Instagram. And I know Twitter has a bad rap. It's like uh, a lot of people are pulling out because of the fighting and stuff. But I I don't know why. I don't feel 
like it's that maybe it's the the guys that I follow or how I just go in and out and and just um you know you write your ideas and they're short and it's um I don't know I find it really helpful the people that I follow so I love jumping on there and um scrolling through just big ideas in small space and some links that are helpful so I like it. I like it a lot I I keep liking it so don't hate me <laughs> I'm not a massive Twitter fan. I wouldn't even know how to do a tweet. You might need to show me later. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I would say it's funny. Um, probably my favorite would be Instagram. I don't post all the time, but I enjoy the engagement, like being able to talk to people and have conversation um, regarding the things that I post. But I was thinking if you were to ask my husband, he probably would say Amazon would be my favorite. <laughs> Because I buy too much stuff, <laughs> too many boxes coming to the front door. So that's my confession. <laughs> I'm probably the same. <laughs> probably Instagram and Amazon. <laughs> if I lived over here, Amazon. it'd be the same. Yeah. <laughs> Target. Sprink- oh, wait, the Target app. Uh huh. You can sprinkle in a, in a little bit of YouTube. <laughs> probably. <laughs> it's been so good to chat again and just refresh our hearts and look to Jesus to help us in this very real uh, dilemma of the, of the age. And so we thank you for listening, and uh, we hope to have you again at the GLOBE podcast. And remember, you are the light of the world. A city that is set upon a hill shall not be hidden. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a basket, but on a light stand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. We hope you join us next time. 